Okay. Right now. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We are really happy to be here to give this presentation to you. My name is Amy Scherer and I'm a senior staff attorney at the National Disability Rights Network. And we're going to be talking about the Vocational Rehabilitation Program, commonly known as the VR program today, and taking you through um, some of the aspects of the VR process and other things associated with the VR program. But before we get into the content, uh, let me introduce or have my colleague, Ron Hager, introduce himself as well. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ron Hager. I'm a managing attorney with the National Disability Rights Network, and I'm also very, very happy to be here with you all today. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Miriam Aliso from the Voice Center, and I will explain how to use some of the features to interact with the Zoom platform. Uh, please use the Q&A feature to ask questions during the presentation. We will be monitoring this area periodically. Eh, van a ver en la banda o cinta negra un globo que indica interpretación. Hagan clic allí y luego seleccionan español si lo necesitan y oprimen donde dice mute original audio. Esto último filtra completamente la presentación en inglés para que puedan escuchar con claridad a Guillermo, nuestro intérprete de hoy. Using American Sign Language. We will pin the interpreter on our side, but you can do that. Uh, to pin the interpreter, hover over the video of the participant you want to pin, in this case, the interpreter, and, and click the three dots. You will see the three little dots over the person you would like to pin. And from the menu, click pin. Next slide. Hang on. I clicked something and once I do, I have to go back. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, before I introduce Mario, who is going to be our companion through this presentation, just wanted to also say that um, we will be taking breaks for questions um, when we um, switch speakers. And so feel free to, um, to put any questions that you may have in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And we will also be asking throughout the presentation at various points for feedback from the audience. So you'll be able to provide that feedback through the chat box as well, and we'll be monitoring that. So with that being said, um, we just want to talk about Mario because that helps us to get a more concrete view of some of the principles that we'll be talking about and hopefully make it a little bit easier to understand. So Mario is 18 years old and he's a high school senior. He has several palsy, uses a seven-year-old power wheelchair for all mobility and relies on accessible transportation to go to school. He turned 18 in February, 2021, and he will graduate from high school in June, 2022. That's an actual typo on the slide. So if you're looking at the slides printed out, uh, make a change there that he's graduating in June of 2022. He plans to go to college and study to become an English teacher at the high school or college level. And we also have a little bit of information here about social security situation um, because we've done this presentation previously for individuals involved in that field, but this is also great information to know. He's currently receiving um, SSI, social security benefits and while receiving the social security dependence benefits is $420 per month. The dad gets the social security retirement while his mom works. In February 2021 at the age of 18, the dependence benefits converted to SSDI as a disabled adult child with the same monthly amount. And he also became began receiving SSI as a parental income no longer considered. So that's just a little bit of background information. Um, in addition, his insurance situation, he has private insurance because he's covered as a dependent on his mom's insurance, and this will continue through age 26. And he also, as of February 2021, 
because he had received SSI Social Security benefits, he became eligible for Medicaid. So all those things kind of factor into um, who pays for what and what VR's role is going to be in Mario's life. Next slide, please. So going back a little bit, just to give a little bit of background information about what the VR program is, um, the law that put it into place is the Rehabilitation Act, which was first passed in 1973. And it has gone through several revisions between uh, 1973 and now, but it was most recently amended by the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act in 2014, commonly known as WIOA. So that's a good acronym to remember. And it was really a big deal when this was done in 2014 because significant changes had not been made prior to that uh, since 1998. And a lot of the changes that were made that we'll be talking about in this presentation were really positive for people with disabilities and helping them to get better services from the VR program. So basically under Title I of the Rehab Act, um, states are given money to provide VR services to persons with disabilities. And the overriding or the, the agency that oversees the program is called the Rehabilitation Services Administration or RSA, which is a division of the Department of Education. And again, as I said, they're responsible for the administration and the oversight of the program. Every state has a state VR agency. In fact, every territory, every territory does as well. So it's the 50 states plus the additional US territories. Some states <clears throat> do have a second agency that serves only individuals who are legally blind. And that's just basically a state by state choice. So just check in your state and see if it's just one general agency or if there are two separate agencies um, designed to serve um, individuals who are blind or visually impaired. Next slide. The great news is that VR can fund a wide range of goods and services as long as it's connected to the person's vocational goal. And that's really the, the second part of that phrase there is really important because VR is designed to help individuals obtain, maintain, and retain employment. But you don't want to just get, get goods and services that are going to maybe make you more independent in your life or make you more independent around your house or your apartment. Um, if VR is involved, the whole key is to connect whatever services and goods are provided to these established vocational goal. Um, Congress has stated that VR services, are, the goal is to maximize employability, economic self-sufficiency, independence and integration into the workplace and the community through comprehensive and coordinated state-of-the-art programs. And that's the specific language used. They really want the programs to be coordinated and done at a high level. And I think it's also important in that paragraph to especially emphasize the fact that the goal here, again, is economic self-sufficiency um, so that people with disabilities are able to live on their own um, with the financial support that they need through the job that they are doing. So here's the first time we're gonna ask you for some input. Um, and this is again, no pressure or anything like that, but we just wanna kind of see what people think. So in the um, chat box, I guess, is, would be the best place to put it. Um, do you think this is a myth or a reality? In order to be eligible for services, an individual must be willing to seek employment so that they no longer need any public benefits such as social security benefits. Okay, we're seeing some come in to the box. Thank you for the responses. I have seen uh, the majority have been uh, myth. Uh, there's been a couple of realities in there, um, but it does look like a good number of people have responded. So I will go ahead and say that this is indeed a myth. Um, despite the fact that I did just emphasize the importance of economic self-sufficiency, it does not mean that you have to go off social security benefits in order to apply for VR services. And unfortunately, that's pretty widespread myth. Um, you may hear people say, well, I'm not gonna apply for VR services or seek employment because I don't wanna lose my benefits. And there really are ways and lots of programs out there to allow you to do um, both things at the same time. 
So it's an important thing to remember. Thanks, Amy. I'm gonna start now talking about uh, more of the specifics of the VR program, beginning with who is eligible for VR services. So the basic eligibility criteria are to receive an uh, services, an individual must have a disability which results in a substantial, substantial impediment to employment and require VR services to prepare for, secure, retain, or regain employment. Any service, as Amy said, that the individual is seeking from the VR agency must be connected to an employment goal. In our hypothetical, Mario wants to go to college to become a teacher. He can't just come to VR and say, I want to go to college. He has to connect uh, going to college with an employment goal. To be a teacher, you have to go to college. So that would be the way Mario would uh, connect his uh, goal of being a teacher with the service of going to college. The potential employment outcomes, and this is one of the things that WIOA did strengthen. The, what the VR agency's goal is for every applicant is full or part-time competitive employment in an integrated setting. By competitive employment, we mean the same uh, terms and conditions of employment that everyone else gets, wages, promotions, other benefits. And in an integrated setting means that the person with a disability is fully integrated with non-disabled workers on the job site. So that's the first uh, and gold standard, if you will, of the employment outcomes. You could also achieve an employment outcome of supported employment, which means you're gonna be getting extra support in your employment, most typically a job coach or other service like that. Uh, the next one is employment in an integrated setting are always gonna be integrated, such as self-employment, customized employment, telecommuting or business ownership. So it doesn't have to necessarily be in a job on, in a factory or business, it could be uh, other types of customized employment. Any employment goal must be consistent with the person's strengths, abilities, and informed choice. We want the person with the disability to be driving the goal and services because that is the person who knows the best way for them to get what they need. We're gonna go into a little bit more detail about the disability criteria. The person must have a mental, physical, or other type of learning disability that interferes with the ability to work. It does not have to be so severe as to qualify for SSDI or SSI. It must only be a substantial impediment to employment. So for example, someone that is receiving a Section 504 plan while they're in school could meet the disability criteria for VR. Recipients of SSDI or SSI, like Mario, are presumed eligible as an individual with a significant disability. So here's our next myth or reality. As a high school student with a disability, is he, is Mario currently eligible for VR services? Uh, yes or no? And you can put your answers again in the chat box. Wow, you guys are sharp. Definitely. Definitely seeing a cascade of yeses. We like to see it. Like to see it. Yes. He is eligible as a student to get VR services. And we're going to go into more detail in a little while. And he does have a disability because he's currently receiving Social Security. So he meets both of the uh, criteria to be eligible for services. And we did just get a question that might be good to address right now. Um, sure. Would a homeschooled student be eligible? That probably depends in some, in some, to some extent on what the definition of homeschool means in your state. Um, we're talking here about national rights, but is a homeschool student considered a student in your state? I'm assuming they are because they have to, you know, students uh, are bound by the compulsory attendance age in a state. So if they're getting homeschool services, they're considered to be a student, I would say, but you need to double check in your state. I think that was it as far as the question so far. And I've got a couple more here. Um, who decides if the individual meets the disability criteria? How do you prove disability? Um, 
that's really what happens is they're going to gather records and information about the student and then the VR counselor would sit down and uh, with the client and make that determination. Um, and uh, basically, uh, there, it's not as hard as you think to, to show eligibility. Um, because uh, if you have a 504 plan, for example, you're presumed to have a disability that is at some level going to interfere with your ability to work. It's not a very high standard. Uh, that substantial impediment is not a very high standard. And then he, we said he is currently receiving SSI and SSDI. Okay. So virtually every person is presumed capable of an employment goal, but the VR agency can deny services if they believe the person is so severely disabled that they cannot benefit from the VR services. However, they have to overcome the presumption of eligibility by what's called clear and convincing evidence, which is an extremely high standard. And before they make that decision, they cannot just go through a paper review of the, of the evaluations. They have to actually provide that person with a variety of trial work experiences in real work settings with appropriate supports such as assistive technology, job coaching, and other types of services. So they have the ability to tell an applicant you're too disabled to benefit from VR program, but they cannot do it without going through this trial work process. And these decisions, we're going to talk a little bit later, the VR agency has a lot of the authority to make decisions subject to the person having the right to due process, very similar to edu education where the school district ultimately makes a decision, but the parents can challenge that determination. So here with the VR system. If a, the, the state is required to provide all the services that every single eligible individual needs, they can't say, well, we're only gonna give everyone a little bit. They have to provide every client, every service they need. If they don't have the resources to do that, they have to go to what is called an order of selection, which is essentially a waiting list for services. And they have to develop a criteria and a policy for determining who is eligible first. And that waiting list has to be designed in such a way that people with the most significant disabilities are highest on the waiting list. And so as the waiting list goes down, people with less severe disabilities are farther down the waiting list. And the reason for that is that in the past, historically, the people with the most significant disabilities were the ones that were shunted aside from the VR system. But the emphasis here is focusing on the people with the most significant disabilities. In making that determination, cost of services cannot be a factor in, in the waiting list. It's just based on the severity of the disability. When the state, if they do go on an order of selection, however, they have to continue to provide services to those who are already getting services. So that at that point, it doesn't matter how severe your disability is. If you're already getting services, you can continue to get services until you're done with the VR system. Again, let's see if there's any questions. Let's see how many states um, have waiting lists and is there a place to continually check this without going state by state? <laughs> Good question. Uh, difficult answer um, because it does change quite frequently. Um, there can be a waiting list, but then the next month there may not be. So uh, there is not a great way to track this um, other than talking to the VR agency in your state. Uh, we are in touch with the Rehabilitation Services Administration as NDRN staff. And so I'll occasionally get updates from them in terms of the overall numbers, but it's in such flux depending upon what's going on in that state that it's hard to keep keep up with it. Uh, there, that is, that's a good question. And there is a client assistance program in every state, which we're gonna talk about a little later. They would probably know if their state is on an order of selection or not. Um, we are, there's some questions about the services that are available. We're going to spend a whole section on available services. So we, we're going to hold off on those questions um, until we, uh, 
until we get uh, through the, um, the process. I think that was it as far as the questions that I've okay. seen so far. Yeah, and the waiting list is separate from the DD system. There was a question about that. And typically I don't think the waiting lists are as long as they are in the DD system, uh, but it depends on how severe the disability is. Someone that would qualify for developmental disability services is probably gonna be pretty high up on the waiting list. Okay. Back to me. So I'm gonna talk about the Individualized Plan for Employment, otherwise known as the IPE, not to be confused with the Individualized uh, Education Plan, the IEP, um, which can be quite confusing since the acronyms are so similar using the same three letters. But what we're talking about here is the IPE, which is the plan for employment for the individual. So the written IPE, which is what I'm gonna refer to it going forward, um, includes the individual's employment goal and specific services to reach that goal. And very, very uh, important advocacy tip here, if you're working with individuals who are in the process of writing their IPE or you're working with VR to help um, individuals do that, um, you wanna try to make the IPE as clear as possible from the beginning and as specific as possible um, so that everyone is on the same page and there's, there's agreement as to especially what the employment goal is and what services are needed. Um, sometimes the problems come about later in the process when it's just vaguely written or not everyone is clear about what the employment goal is and how you're going to get there. So advocacy tip, just try to make it as clear and as specific as you can from the beginning. Uh, uh, you could also have as part of the IPE a comprehensive assessment as necessary to determine employment outcome, objectives, nature, and scope of VR services. And this is really important because not everyone that walks into the VR office is gonna know. I absolutely know that I wanna become an English teacher as Mario does, but especially high school students. I mean, who really knew what you wanted to do when you were a senior in high school? So VR can help to, um, to determine those things and help an individual explore their options through assessments as part of the IPE. Uh, it also may include a referral for rehab technology services, otherwise known as assistive technology or AT for short, to assess and develop the, the capacities of the individual to perform in a work environment. And notice, this is at the beginning of the process when you're just developing the individualized plan for employment. It is possible to do an AT evaluation. And uh, that is very important as well, because sometimes you'll hear from VR, well, we're, we'll worry about what the AT options might be once the person is employed or has a job offer, then we'll figure out what type of assessment to do. But that really is too late in the process for so many people, because if you do the AT assessment at the beginning, it may even change the job options that are on the table and the type of training the person might be able to pursue. So it's really important to remember, to remember that the AT assessment can happen at the beginning of the IPE development. And really it should happen um, if, it's, if it's relevant to that person, it should happen as early on in the process as possible. And we talked about this a little bit already, um, but informed choice is really, really important. Uh, again, this is designed to be a client directed process and you want to have respect for the individual dignity, personal responsibility, self-determination and pursuit of meaningful careers um, based on what the individuals with disabilities say they want to do. Now, this is a great um, discussion to have and a great concept to discuss. Sometimes it's not um, executed as well on VR's end as it could be because they don't always present all the inform the choices that could be presented to the client. And sometimes it can be a situation where a box is checked on a piece of paper saying that the client was given choices um, throughout the VR process. So you really wanna make sure if you're involved in this advocacy that the, the choices are actually presented and the person involved does have the ability to make a choice between different options. Uh, but again, going back to the congressional uh, language, it really is supposed to be a consumer driven program because that's what's going to be most effective in getting people 
giving people jobs. I mean, who really wants to do a job that they're not interested in doing? And, you know, you're not going to be very motivated. You may not work very hard. So that's why it's really important, um, especially with the employment goals that we are looking at what the client or consumer wants to do. So there are a number of requirements in terms of what has to go into the IPE. And, and as you probably guessed by now, um, the employment outcome is a big part of that. Also, um, services to be provided. And we're about to talk in a few minutes about what those services would be. And luckily, it's a very wide range of services um, that can help the client get to their employment outcome. There also should be a timeline. So you're going to try to um, set goals and um, dates and things like that to say when certain services are going to be completed, when certain goals are going to be reached in order for the person to get to their ultimate employment outcome. Uh, but as we'll talk about later too, that timeline is not set in stone. It can change as other things change and you're not tied to specific dates that are in the initial IPE, nonetheless, they should be there in order to guide the process. Also, there should be um, information about who's providing the services. And this is another area where um, informed choice really comes into the process because uh, the client should be given choices about which vendors or entities they wanna use to get the services that they're discussing. You also wanna have the criteria for evaluating the progress and that should be tracked. And then also the responsibilities of VR, individual or other agencies if, if applicable. And that's another situation where you wanna to try to be as clear as possible um, in terms of who is responsible for what so that you know three months into working with the client, um, there's not a huge argument about VR saying, well, I thought, this other agency was paying for it and the other agency saying, I thought VR was paying for it. If you can get that laid out in the IPE from the beginning, it can make things a lot easier. Next slide. The IPE must be reviewed at least annually and notice the phrase there at least. Um, so you've got to do it at, at least once a year but that doesn't mean that it can't happen more often. And as things are changing or different things develop, um, you should be definitely willing or encouraging uh, VR and the client to review the IPE. As I mentioned on the previous slide, it must be amended if necessary due to changes in the employment outcome. And that happens a lot. People start out with one job goal and then they get you know, maybe even a year into the process and decide, you know, that's not what I want to do. So it's possible to go back and change that. It's also possible to go back and change VR services or again, who is providing the VR service to the individual, the, the entities or the vendors providing the services. So all of that, if any of those things change, the IPE needs to be amended. And it's important to note that the um, IPE can be amended at any time. There's not a time frame in which that would have to happen. I mean, you may have, you know, five or six amendments in, a, in one year if things really change or if the person decides to go in a different direction. And there's no limit on how many changes can be made. But it is important to note that the changes will not take place until they're agreed to by the individual and the VR counselor. So they have to be on the same page. And as you might imagine, that can sometimes create conflict if, um, if those two individuals are not on the same page, but it's important again that we're listening to the informed choices of the client and what changes that client would like to have and the VR counselor should do everything they can to help them reach that goal. Next slide. There's a question that came up on that right then. I think might as well take it now. Okay. We do it every year. From what date, the sign date, the start of the position, or another time frame? What's the typical time frame for the annual review? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and uh, different VR agencies may do it differently, but I think uh, the first option that you suggested is probably the best one to review it from the day that the IPE is signed. And it is really important. I don't think we talked about this specifically, but you want to make sure that you get signatures by both the client and the counselor on the IPE because that's what really puts it into effect. And so it would make sense then if 
if you signed it on that particular date to then do a review um, a year later from the signed date. So that's probably the best practice. Um, there might be other approaches to that, but I would say generally the date the IPE is signed. And then for closing the record of services, the stage that we hope that everyone gets to, because um, this is the ultimate goal, um, and this occurs, uh, the case is closed when a person is able to achieve and maintain employment for at least 90 days. So that's not a really long period of time, but hopefully it's long enough to at least uh, be able to assess the situation, figure out if this is the right job match for the person, and if the person is doing well and stable on the job. Now, again, it's really important, as I was talking about on the previous slide, that there is agreement between the individual and VR that the, that the outcome is satisfactory and the individual is performing well. As you might also imagine, sometimes there's disagreement here. VR sometimes you know, wants to close the case because they are tracking how many successful closures they get per year and they want that number to be as high as possible. So they would like to do it quickly. So sometimes they want to close the case, but the individual's like, no, you know, this job isn't working or I'm not satisfied. And so that is why both people need to be on the same page before the case is officially closed. Um, and then the other great thing, though, about the way that VR is set up is there's something called post-employment services. And what that means is that this would be you are working, you're doing well, your case has been closed, but all of a sudden, um, something happens on the job, maybe there's a change in job duties from when you initially started the job and you need some support in order to maintain the job that you have. Um, perhaps it's maybe even just having someone come in and um, you know, change the work setup or change the way um, the equipment is laid out for the new duty that you have to do. But the overall goal is that VR can come in even when the case has been closed and try to provide any support that would be needed to help that individual maintain the job that they have. Now, just a note about that, it's not intended to be a long-term service. So if you're going into post-employment services, it should be something that's relatively brief, easy to perform, and not something that would be, again, long-term investment in money or time. If that was the case, then you'd probably have to reopen the um, case again and, um, you know, start providing services under a new case. But if there's something that can be done in the short term to allow the person to maintain their job, then that is certainly allowable and is, can be a really good service to help people maintain the job that they have. All right, I've been answering a few of the questions in the uh, Q&A box directly, Amy, some of the ones that are more uh, limited. So I think we'll just keep going here. So right. I'm gonna be talking now about available services. And the first question is a myth or reality. Uh, once an individual is found eligible for VR services, he or she is entitled to any VR service they want. Myth or reality. And we don't, these are kind of tricky. So let's see what we, let's see what th people say. Uh, myth, myth, myth. You guys are brilliant. Myth, <laughs> myth, myth, myth. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's a myth. Remember, every service has to be connected to the employment goal. They can get any service they need that is connected to the employment goal, but it has to be connected to that employment goal. So let's start by looking at what services uh, are available. First, as we said a couple of times, <laughs> any service that's needed to assist the person to prepare for, secure, retain, advance in, or regain an employment outcome. And this is something that's been emphasized in WIOA, that the VR program is not just equipped or designed for entry-level work, that for people that are capable for higher-level work, uh, the VR agency should be providing the services for a person to uh, reach that type of an employment outcome. So any service that's needed to equip the individual for employment, the severity of disability, the cost of services can have no bearing on the scope of services an individual receives. There is some 
financial issues that come into play, which Amy will be going through. But in terms of the type of services, we put the services the, student, the person needs, not based on cost, not based on availability. And the types of services are incredibly broad and incredibly varied. First of all, the assessment itself uh, is part of the services. Counseling, guidance, job placement services. Um, I don't know what I wanna do when I grow up. As, as Amy talked about, that can be part of the VR services. Vocational and other training, including higher education. So Mario wants to go to college to become a teacher. That is something that is covered, including if he, uh, birch, uh, books would also be covered. Um, if someone is not going to college, but some other type of vocational training, that would also be covered. Diagnosis and treatment of physical or mental impairments um, to the extent of it, the, the support is not available from other sources. And pretty much every service under VR, where you'd have to look to see whether there was some other source of funding. So for Mario, both his private insurance and his Medicaid could potentially be looked at for funding. Um, but, but if there is no other source of funding available, then VR would provide that. Maintenance for additional costs incurred during other rehabilitation services. So for example, if Mario is going to college away from home um, and he needs a uh, extra funding uh, to have a res residence in the, uh, in the dorms or whatever at college, that maintenance costs can be included. Personal assistance services, given Mario's description, he might need an aid to help him uh, get ready for school in the morning, that could potentially also be uh, covered, at least while he's receiving other VR services. When Mary was done with college, if he is gonna need ongoing personal assistance uh, support when he's at a job, then you, you need to be thinking about, well, who is gonna be funding that? For Mario, given that he's a recipient of Medicaid, that would potentially be a source of ongoing funding for that service. Transportation including training in public transportation and other types of transportation in connection with any other VR service needed by the individual to achieve an employment outcome. Here, Mario's already getting accessible transportation to and from his high school. He may need accessible transportation to get to and from the college. The problem with this particular service, it's only available when he's getting other VR services. So once he's done with college and any other VR services, for example, going to a job, how is he going to get to and from that job? So part of the uh, planning for Mario should include considering that. Um, transportation definition can include a vehicle purchase, but this is an extremely difficult thing to get uh, in many states. They don't really want to fund it. Um, so you may want to think about alternatives uh, for Mario uh, to, to fund a purchase of a vehicle. This is a fairly sophisticated crop crowd. Um, we have it set up so he's getting both SSDI and SSI. So one option for Mario might be a plan for achieving self-support to set aside money uh, for a purchase of a vehicle when he graduates from college. Interpreter services for individuals who are deaf, readers, uh, rehabilitation, teaching, orientation, and mobility services, are all types of things that can be provided. Occupational licenses, tool, equipment, initial stocks. You know, you see, what does a person need? I'm gonna be setting up my own business. Well, I'm gonna need an initial stock for setting up that business. I'm gonna to need tools to set up that business. Technical assistance for those who are pursuing telecommuting, self-employment, or small business operation. Self-employment is one of those things that VR agencies tend to really not like to support. We see many times them um, pushing and putting obstacles in people's way. So this is a place where you might need outside support and advocacy to help navigate the system to get uh, the uh, self-employment plan going. This gets a little confusing. <laughs> so we have the transportation service, which is separate from vehicle modifications and other types of assistive technology. So if Mario does have a vehicle and he needs to have that modified for him to be able to drive it with hand controls, or other types of things, that's a separate service that VR can fund independent of who purchases the vehicle. Okay, here's the answer to that question from the myth of reality. Transition services for students with disabilities 
is a covered service. It's listed right in the VR service list. Doesn't mean that they will always provide it. They can look to the school system to provide services, but there may be some things that the school is not gonna do that may also be needed by Mario. By Mario. Supported employment, we talked about that already. Services to the family to assist in receiving, reaching that employment outcome. Remember how we said it's very, very, very broad? This is the catch-all, other goods or services necessary to achieve an employment outcome. So even if it's not on this list, which it's pretty long, like what, this is the sixth slide? It still could potentially be covered by the VR agency. And, and uh, Amy already mentioned the idea of post-employment services to uh, enable a person to maintain, uh, retain, or uh, advance in employment. Um, any questions, Mario? I mean, yeah, Mario. <laughs> any questions, Amy? So, I got Mario on yeah, the brain. We have a couple. Um, are there services that depend on family or individual income? Uh, it doesn't affect your eligibility for VR services, but it may affect how much VR is going to contribute um, to, to the cost of services. And we'll talk about that a little bit um, in the upcoming slides. Um, then there was another question about, does transportation include learning how to drive? Um, I'm not sure it actually falls under transportation per se. Ron, correct me if I'm wrong, but I can tell you that um, a driving evaluation and driving training could be something that VR could pay for. Again, if it's connected to the individual and what their established job goal is. So you would need to really show that learning how to drive would be important for the um, for the person to be able to to reach their job goal, and then we got a more specific one about um, VR funding, and I'm summarizing here. But um, the she was told by VR that for her son that they could not fully fund the cost of college, and the son had to commit to attend a college by May first. So um, that is a comp the financial contribution, particularly for post-secondary education can be very complicated and um, they do not necessarily pay for the entire cost of the college education. However, that is a whole separate, different set of rules if um, the individual is a social security recipient. So if that was the situation with your son, um, they may need to reevaluate their contribution. But again, we're going to talk more about the cost um, rules and regulations that are in place in just a moment. And this might be one you may need to get uh, individual help on uh, for your case. Services are supposed to be available at the time needed, but it, it, it gets very tricky, as Amy said. So let's go back. I listed a whole ton of services really quickly. So let's go back and think about Mario, some of the things that he needs, might need, and what type of services can you think of that might be needed for him to reach his employment goal? Um, so please post your answers in the chat box. And this again would be related specifically to Mario. Um, the case so, that, we, that yeah, we presented at the beginning. College is one. Is there some other ones? Let's see. I don't see. Oh, here come. Let's see. Mentoring. Mentoring. Possibly. Yeah. Audiobooks in college. Job coach. Job coach. We may not know. We, that's a, job coach is a good thought. We may not actually know that yet if he would need that type of support. But if he did, it would be something that VR could provide. Personal assistant, AT, benefits counseling. Good ones. Those are all good thoughts. He might need a transportation. <coughs> he might need a wheelchair. You know, his wheelchair is seven years old. Uh, case management. So there's a lot of things that can be uh, provided. Now, the VR agency would not provide college disability services. That would be the college's job but there might need to be connections with them as part of the plan. Uh, personal assistant uh, came up. So yeah, this is a good list of things. I'm glad you guys thought of assistive technology, a personal assistant and other things. 
So we're going to go on now uh, to Amy. Yes. So I'm going to talk about some of the VR services policies. And again, this is based on federal law. So this is essentially should be the same um, no matter what state you're in, um, in terms of the overall policies. They must develop policies and these must be in writing. And the other important thing is that the services are provided based on each person's individual needs. Sometimes that gets lost in the process. Um, they're used to doing things a certain way um, and they're not looking at the individual needs of the person or the individual facts of the case. So really important to keep that in mind from an advocacy standpoint. But in general, you cannot place any um, arbitrary limits on the nature and scope of the VR services to be provided to achieve an employment outcome. So you can't say, you know, we're only gonna provide uh, these services. And then once we provide that, we're not doing anything else. You cannot put a limit. Again, it should be connected to what the person needs to achieve the employment outcome that's been established. Next slide. Sorry, Amy, I'm trying to answer one in the chat box. Oh, no, that's okay. Whoops, I think we might have gone past. Too far? Yeah, go back okay. one. Uh, is, it? is that the next one? We'll see. Go back one more. Um, okay, so just one forward from there. I'm sorry, I can't see it right now. No problem. <laughs> trying to, be, trying to multitask, not yeah, doing well. You're doing, you're doing a very good job. I appreciate your help. Um, so another overall rule is that they um, may have reasonable time periods to provide services. So again, as I mentioned earlier, it's okay to have timelines in there and goals to complete the services, but they can't be so short as to effectively deny a service and must permit exceptions so individual needs can be addressed. And the rule uh, for exceptions is an important thing to remember if you're advocating on behalf of VR clients, because sometimes VR is not incredibly upfront about the fact that there are always exceptions to the policies that they have in writing, and um, you, but you may need to ask for it because they may not always uh, offer up that option. Uh, also, payment rates may not be so low as to effectively deny a necessary service and may not be absolute. For example, let's say, just throwing out numbers here, that uh, the lowest in-state college tuition rate uh, in a particular state is $2,500 per semester, but the only, but VR in that state will only pay $500 a semester. So that's leaving a $2,000 gap, which basically in my mind would be so low that you're effectively denying the service because that's such a huge gap to make up. Um, it's also important to note that you can't put an absolute uh, limit on how much they can pay. Again, that needs to be based on individual circumstances and subject to possible exceptions. Next slide. This is crazy, sorry, Amy. No, that's okay. Uh, this is one of my favorite slides uh, because it was something that changed under WIOA again that was passed in 2014. And it was so hard to get this, um, to get VR to consider these things before WIOA, but now it's clearly in the language about the provision of advanced training. And it actually encourages qualified individuals. So you have to be, it's not just anybody wanting it. You actually have to be able to meet the requirements of an advanced training program, but uh, to pursue advanced training in science, technology, engineering, or math, including computer science, medicine, law, or business. So this opens up a lot more options that were not previously there for VR to, to consider and support graduate school, medical school, law school. And they do specifically um, mention some particular careers there, obviously, but it's not limited to just those options. That's important to know. Next slide. So financial needs criteria. Again, this is sort of the crux of where a lot of the conflict comes, and we could probably spend an hour just talking about this area. So this is going to be a quick overview of the financial needs criteria. Um, the policy that VR has must specify which cert, which specify which services will be subject to financial need because they not, they're not all 
subject to that financial needs test. And they must take into account disability related expenses when they are applying that financial needs test. Uh, and must not be so high as to effectively deny an individual a necessary service. Again, kind of going with the theme that you don't want to, um, you don't want to put uh, limits that are that are making it difficult for anybody to access services. So there are certain exempt services, and these would be things where, again, financial need does not come into play. Diagnostic services, when you're trying to figure out, you know, what an individual might be dealing with in terms of their mental or physical impairment, counseling, guidance, and referral services, um, job placement, personal assistance services, again, that is when an individual is receiving a VR service though, as well as auxiliary aids and services such as interpreters or readers. So those things, the finan financial cr criteria is not uh, significant. And then SSI and S SDI recipients, including people who are receiving 1619B Medicaid are exempt from the financial need criteria and they should not be required to participate in the cost of VR services. We're trying to get a clarification on that on the federal level. Um, NDRN feels like the, the language federal regulations are pretty clear, but it's not really being apl uh, applied across the board that way in every state as it should be. So we're working to get further clarification on that issue. Okay, another myth or reality question and Hopefully this will be pretty clear based upon what we just talked about. The main goal of the VR program is to help individuals with disabilities obtain entry level employment. Myth or reality in the chat box. Okay, so several myths, which is good to hear, um, good to see. And I'm just gonna move along quickly because I know we uh, want to make sure that we uh, get through all the material that is correct. It is a myth. Um, especially under WIOA, the, the most recent revisions, um, they really do want to put much more emphasis on um, careers and not just entry level employment or not just the first open job that an individual can do. Next slide. I think that's, is that you, Ron? You, that's you, unless you want me to do it. Oh, no, that's fine. I just couldn't see the bottom of the slide oh. number. Um, <laughs> so comparable benefits. Uh, we mentioned this a little bit earlier, uh, but VR agencies are considered the pair of last resort for many services. But it's also funny because a lot of agencies will all say they're the pair of last resort. So it doesn't really clarify the situation, but uh, they will not pay for a service if similar or comparable benefits are available through another provider. Uh, for example, if a person qualifies for services through Medicaid, VR will not provide them. And if we think about Mario, he had Medicaid. He also had private insurance through one of his parents. So that definitely in that scenario decreases the chances that VR is going to be the one to step in and pay for um, certain services. But um, as we were talking about earlier with the question about the college education being paid for by VR, um, it must be available at the time needed. So if there is another um, provider such as a private insurance agency, but they're not gonna be able to approve it for six months to a year, then you could possibly make the argument depending on the facts that um, VR should step in and provide the service. And there, it's also important to note that there are um, resources that are not comparable benefits. This is really important to know because you don't even go through the analysis to figure out if it is a comparable benefit because it's definitely not. Um, student loans, which must be repaid. Scholarships and awards based on merit. And we mentioned this briefly earlier, SSS, SSI's plan for achieving self-support or pass. Um, so those things are not factored into the comparable benefits analysis. And that brings us to, and I may have actually um, answered this already, um, but are there any comparable benefits that would need to be considered before VR paid for services for him? And I really did answer that. And given the time that we have, um, again, because he had he has Medicaid, 
he has private insurance as well. So those would likely come into play for Mario, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just clear, it's good to be clear on that when you're approaching VR and asking them to uh, pay for services. You just, you just need to realize that other things are gonna be factored in if they are available. Okay, I'm gonna talk about uh, pre-employment and transition services. And then we wanna talk a little bit about due process and hearing rights. Um, and there's been a lot of questions in the Q&A. Many of them are very specific. Um, we really are just gonna probably try and finish doing our presentation. Uh, we should be done by three. And then maybe we can take about five minutes longer to go over for some of the questions that have uh, appeared, or we can arrange a system of responding to your questions after this webinar. I really thank you for your questions. They're, they're tough questions. A lot of them are not easy to answer, uh, but I thank you for your very thoughtful uh, questions. So what is the role of the VR agency in transition? And this quote is from comments. Uh, both of the quotes are from comments from the 2001 regulation that VR should participate actively throughout the transition planning process not just when the student is nearing graduation. The VR agency should be attending VR meetings, IEP meetings, I'm sorry, special ed IEP meetings. And when transition services are provided by VR, as with any other service, they have to go through uh, and qualify as el be eligible and develop an IPE. So as we said, there's very clear expectation that the VR agency should be involved with students during the transition years. What we've seen is VR has not been doing that. As a result, the WIOA set aside 15% of state's VR funding for pre-employment transition services because they weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing all along. And these are services to students with disabilities. They do not have to apply for VR services. So Mario, uh, as an SSI, SSDI recipient would be eligible, a student eligible under IDEA, a student under, eligible under Section 504, all these students would be able to get pre-employment transition services. They can include job exploration counseling. Again, I don't know what I want to do when I grow up. Actual work-based learning experiences in integrated settings in or outside of school. One of the biggest disadvantages that many people with disabilities have is they, in terms of work, is they never were able to work while they were in high school. So one of the things that can be done, if needed, is to give the students the job-based experiences while they're still in school. Counseling on post-secondary opportunities. And these can be funded by the VR, all of these can be funded by the VR agency, the uh, school, or both. 15% of the VR agency's total budget has to be spent on these types of services. Workplace readiness training, social skills, independent living skills, another huge barrier for many people with disabilities. It's not the ability to do the mechanics of the job, but the soft skills that go along with working in a work environment. Self-advocacy skills, all too often I think parents do the advocacy for their children while they're in high school, and, and then the student has to become an independent advocate. So that's something that uh, is important as a person gets uh, older and needs to be able to advocate for themselves. Now, these are supposed to be individualized services, not one size fits all, not go to a lab or go to a workshop or go to a, web a webinar. These are supposed to be actual hand-on services that people should be receiving. So for Mario, would he be eligible for plea employment transition services. And I cheated again, because I said, yeah, he would be, <laughs> because he's a student with a disability. So we're gonna just keep going. We only have a couple more slides here. Um, so we're gonna just keep going. So the bottom line, for students who have not received VR services while they're still in school, VR must determine eligibility and develop an IEPE as soon as possible during transition, but at the latest, by the time the student leaves public school. Requiring the IPE to be in place before the student exits school is essential toward ensuring smooth transition process, one in which students do not suffer 
unnecessary delays in services so they can continue to make progress toward employment that they began to receive while in school. There was a question about the timing of agreeing to pay for college. The IPE, which includes all the services that the person needs, is supposed to be developed before the student leaves school. There may be extenuating circumstances, but that's the basic bottom line. Now, what happens if you don't like what VR is saying? Are you stuck? You have to just do what you, they say? No. In the same uh, as under IDEA, there are appeal and hearing rights. So if VR is making a decision that you disagree with, you do have the right to appeal. And there are several steps in this appeal process. The first would be an impartial dupe. First of all, you can always mediate, negotiate, try and resolve it informally. But if you cannot resolve it informally, the first step would be an impartial due process hearing. There is the possibility in some states of a second level of administrative review. Then finally, the appeal to federal or state court. This process is a very complex process. So many, most people are gonna, are gonna need help to navigate this system. There is help. Every state and territory in the country has a program called the Client Assistance Program, which is funded by RSA and is available in every state and territory. Most states have this client assistance program within the protection and advocacy program. There are some client assistance programs that are independent. You can go on our website, which is www.ndrn.org. And there is a spot where you can uh, type in, uh, and I will share it in the chat. Actually, um, I think it just happened. Um, oh, good. Um, uh, you can go the on that in the chat. Thanks. And you can put the, you can go on the website and it says finding help in your state. And you can find out if it's a separate cap or independent or a joint cap. And then you can uh, get the um, uh, services there. There it is. So it's in the chat. So uh, is there some questions in the Q&A that we can take a couple of minutes to answer uh, that we think that might be of benefit to the broadest group of people? And I here's am our, looking now. Well, I am is looking. Here's our contact information. Although if you have very specific individual uh, questions, you may need to go to your state, not to us. And uh, that's the end of the PowerPoint. So I think we could uh, probably try to address this one briefly. Um, what happens if the individual changes his or her mind and wants to try another college or career? Um, again, that should be possible. Um, you know, it's probably going to take some negotiation with VR, particularly if they have already paid for um, training or schooling to go in one direction. Um, but it is up to the individual and their informed choice. I think they would just need to, you know, very clearly explain why the initial career or college plan is not working, what the ne what the new plan is, and um, specifically what services would be needed. And then that way, um, the IPE could then be amended and the person could go on with their plan B. So um, it's not just going to be an automatic easy thing, particularly if the person's going in a completely different direction, but it certainly is possible. Thanks, you, question. Oh, go yeah. ahead, Ron. I was to say, there's questions about when uh, someone might want to con contact the client assistance program anytime. Their job is to help you understand your rights as well as to help you uh, navigate with the VR agency. Wonderful. Um, if I, there are so many questions, so much great information, I wanted to thank both Amy and Ron for this awesome presentation. We have some um, products, uh, resources, in addition to both this webinar recording and the PowerPoint that will be coming out shortly, um, within the week, I would say. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Um,
I didn't introduce myself at the beginning, but my name is Josie Badger, and I work with uh, Raise, and so it's great to have lo our longtime partners uh, with NDRN and Ron and now Amy with us today. So thank you all so very much for joining. Please fill out our survey, um, and we look forward to joining you, know, you in our next webinar. So thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank bye you. Bye.